Hello and welcome to the Global Societies podcast. This is our uh, first interview of a professor. Uh, this is uh, Dylan Lambert Gillum. I'm a third year uh, Global Studies major. And with me, I am Beth Labens. I'm a second year Global Studies and Linguistics major. And here with us today is. My name is Paul Amar. I'm a Global Studies professor. And yeah, I'm thrilled to support the Global Societies Journal, which is one of the premier undergrad run and edited journals. So that's really exciting. We're here today to talk with Professor Amar about his book, uh, The Security Archipelago, which is the winner of the Charles Taylor Best Book of the Year Award from the American Political Science Association, and to talk a little bit about his career. Uh, so our first question is, can you briefly introduce on why you chose Rio de Janeiro and Cairo as the main focuses in your book? Great, yeah. So uh, I had lived for about eight years of my life in Cairo and about three years of my life in Rio de Janeiro. And I had also worked for the United Nations based in New York for about five years. So, but basically I returned to Cairo and Rio because I realized that uh, when I was living in those uh, cities, often working as a journalist and a human rights activist, among other things, that those cities had really become globally visible, not just in their regions, but really on a planetary scale because they were hubs of experimental projects in security, social control, and also uh, new kinds of development that mixed security practices in an attempt to market these countries for new kinds of commerce, for new kinds of identity, and in the end, creating the fabric of an entirely different kind of society, but one in which the military and police were going to, going to play increasingly prominent roles, not just in repressive functions, but also in supposedly um, humanitarian or rescue-oriented kind of missionary type roles. So I realized that these two cities had attracted me from the start because they were very visible globally, um, full of kind of imaginaries of where the future of these two regions, the Middle East and Latin America, were going. But they were really exciting for me as a scholar because they were places where you could research police and military relationships with society, but not just you know guns and repression, but also these moral, gender, sexual and cultural dimensions, which were so important in both those cities. Let's go back a second ago to when you were talking about uh, basically how humanitarian uh, mm -hmm. discourse is being used uh, recently by security institutions. Can you give a little bit of an explanation of what you mean by that? Right. Well, since the, um, particularly, you know, since the 1980s, um, civil societies in Egypt and in Brazil, in different ways but on parallel tracks, have both been mobilizing in order to demilitarize political society. So, of course, we've had, in the 1980s, civil society movements pushed the military regime, a military dictatorship that had been in power since 1964, um, eventually pushed out by pressure from social movements from below, as well as, of course, international human rights activism, as well as mobilization from elites. Um, but then after the 1980s, then social movements turned increasingly to also demilitarize the role of the police in society. So if the military were um, eventually uh, pressured to step down from their role in the dictatorship, but the police actually expanded their role in daily life in a more and more militarized and invasive way. But how, how did they expand that role in daily life in the context of a political society that was explicitly trying to demilitarize. Well, the police would often expand their role by justifying their interventions in society as humanitarian interventions, as very violent, <laughs> but still those that saw themselves as rescuing um, proper, respectable culture from the perversions of cultural forms linked to narco-traffic or to sex work or humanitarian type intervention to try to rescue certain kind of minority groups from the domination by criminal or predatory elements, or different kind of humanitarian discourses about actually defining um, the individual human consumer as opposed to different kinds of corrupt 
or perverse elements in society. So paradoxically, at this time in which we had movements to demilitarize society, we had movements within police to militarize police and to expand police power in society, but constantly playing these interesting political games in which a humanitarian mission was married to a kind of um, targeting of people because of their sexuality or their race. So it was both rescuing people and targeting people in this kind of cycle of um, expanding police interference. And so I actually found some remarkable similarities in the way that in both these societies, Egypt, which also had a military government starting in the 50s, which was a different kind of military government, but by the time the 80s came, it resembled Brazil's government in certain ways in that you had a military and development elite that was very conservative, facing off against the rest of civil society, and within the police playing this kind of missionary, very violent kind of missionary role in between. So it was interesting to compare those two things, specifically because I wrote my book as the kind of war on narco-traffic and the war on terror heated up in both these places, and in which people were focusing so much on the extremism, either the ideological extremism uh, uh, of Islamists or the social extremism of narco-trafficker paramilitary groups, but few people were actually looking at the origin of the real violence in the war on terror and the war on narco-traffic as mm -hmm. coming from within the state itself, coming from within the entrepreneurial and moralistic projects of the state itself. Mm -hmm. So um, how has moral <coughs> policing and these paternalistic rescue campaigns, such as Operation Princess in Rio, mm -hmm. repressed and undermined the, the real and necessary discourses on race, gender, and sexuality? Oh, that's a good question. So Operation Princess, which is one of the chapters in the book, um, focuses on Operation Princess was the name of a again one of these kind of pseudo humanitarian police rescue campaigns in which the police uh, based on their own very sketchy research data um, determined that Rio de Janeiro was being infiltrated by um, trafficking networks that were kidnapping and selling young girl children um, kidnapping them in Rio and selling them on the world market. So this is a data, again, raised, generated by police in alliance with, uh, again, some, some very inexperienced researchers coming from some rather um, ambitious kind of marginal evangelical and Pentecostal church organizations. So this police Pentecostal alliance created this vision of Operation Princess, which is going to be a rescue campaign that would cleanse Rio of its sins, basically by rescuing girl children and stopping sex trafficking now so on some levels by focusing on children by focusing on sex trafficking it kind of pulled the carpet out from underneath a lot of women's groups sexuality rights activist groups gay and lesbian rights activist groups and sex worker or prostitutes rights activist groups that at the same time were fighting against incredibly high levels of police violence and racketeering. Racketeering is where police kind of force people to pay them bribes or else they'll beat them up or they'll bar arrest them continuously. So paradoxically, the police then use this moral rescue campaign, Operation Princess, to intensify their attacks upon these gay and lesbian groups, these sex worker rights groups, and these women's groups that were trying to fight against police corruption. So this is the, the this kind of trick with the human security state that is the theme of my book is that we have to watch out for when things that sound like protective and um, progressive campaigns to stop trafficking or to protect children how easily those can be picked up by the most coercive and repressive um, organizations and often in this case it's often that these moral missions are picked up by police just when they are at their absolute worst and when feminist groups and sexuality rights groups are actually really succeeding in exposing the problems of the police. So in this case, this has started a whole process. Or actually, in, in the book, I describe how this coalition of workers' rights and feminist rights, LGBT rights groups, actually allied with prostitutes, demonstrated there were actually almost no minors or children being 
trafficked in Rio at all, and that this had been generated by kind of fake data by the police. Um, but sadly, it produced a precedent. It produced this imagination that there is this problem out there, and it produced a new reputation for the police as people that can solve the problems of sex trafficking in the city. So unfortunately, every time a new World Cup event or Olympic event or something comes about, they can draw upon this imagination and this moral panic and redeploy another Operation Princess. So it's constantly putting feminists and gay rights activists and prostitution empowerment organizations on the defensive. So obviously this could be a bit of a tricky question, but what might it look like if someone in Brazil was arrested for activity that's technically legal? Mm -hmm. You mean in the context of these sex work campaigns or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I think so. Right. In the I mean, it, of sex work. right. So I mean, it, this is this is the the tension between policing and the law, right? We know in the United States we're dealing with a lot of these controversies now, where it seems like policing is operating in a much larger sphere of discretion and often violent discretion that is much larger than what's actually legal and illegal, mm -hmm. right? It's totally legal, supposedly, to have freedom of speech and to protest the United States. But yet, somehow, there's so much discretion around what is legal protest and what is somehow excessive protest that violence can be unleashed on extreme levels. This is where the police discretion has become a much larger sphere than actually the sphere of the law. And this is a huge problem. This is a sign of rampant militarization of the police. Usually the law should be specific. And of course, we used to call something law enforcement, right? It was that the police were supposed to enforce very carefully, very specific laws. And if they went beyond the most minimal definition of that law, then the evidence was thrown out, the person was assumed innocent, etc. Now, Brazil is, of course, an extreme case of this, right, in which we have police uh, enforcing social control um, often through these, you know, kind of intensely moralistic attacks on drug trafficking or sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. Trafficking is kind of the police version of the word capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. They're just attacking the evils um, of the kind of moralized evils of drug trafficking and sex trafficking. But so ironically, prostitution is legal in Brazil. But just like when you say protests are legal in the United States, well, prostitute, if um, she or he is given a contact by a friend, if she hears about somebody else's client who's really nice, then they can be accused of pimping their friends or their friends pimping them. If they have a client back to their house, then they can say they can be accused of owning a brothel. And brothels are illegal. Pimping is illegal. Trafficking is illegal. So if their friend visits them from Argentina, they can be put in jail as a sex trafficker because their friend crossed a border. So this is a, this is a huge problem which we're starting to see, especially whenever you use like the magic word trafficking, in which police discretion becomes much, much larger than what the spirit of the law implies. The law in Brazil says prostitution is legal, which does not mean that violence against women is legal, of course not, which doesn't mean that forced prostitution or sexual assault is legal, of course not. But the spirit of the law, which is supposed to allow women to, mostly women, of course, to work in this sector as workers rather than as criminals, the spirit of that law has started to kind of um, be displaced by this violent culture of the police. I'm glad you brought in the comparison to the United States. I'm hoping that um, you can elaborate on how the topics in this Curity Archipelago relate to the situation in the United States, particularly um, what has been called civil disorder and unrest in places like Ferguson, Missouri. Mm. Right. Well, um, the, the cases I work on have their own histories and they are unique, but um, absolutely this these times the United States reminds me why I went to work in Egypt and Brazil is very much as someone who grew up in the South during struggles around racial segregation. I saw a lot of um, violence. Um, I was bused to a mostly black school and my bus was often attacked by the Ku Klux Klan and they wow. would drag me off the bus 
to quote unquote rescue me from the black school <laughs> as a white southern boy. And so I, I, I knew very much, and the police too often would just stand by and watch. So I, you know, have a long history of being suspicious of these rescue <laughs> campaigns that have actual kind of racial and violent histories. So, so yeah, now looking, of course, at this movement we have in the United States um, that is facing uh, police violence and that's remembering um, the really racially specific character of that, I think it's really useful to see the, the, the victories and the mobilizing strategies of people in other countries that have dealt with this problem on even a more um, aggressive scale. Um, and I think there is a lot more dialogue now between places like Brazil and the United States about police violence and militarization. Um, Brazil in the 1980s went through what we have been going through in the last years specifically in that we had a society um, pour guns and weaponry and tanks and funding into the police in ways that transformed them into an army and in which transformed police psychologically into thinking often of not law relating to citizenship but police relating to a kind of enemy population and that's a very dangerous dynamic and I think that's become very visible in Ferguson and in the recent cases in in Oakland and in New York and also in recent cases of attacks against Muslim Americans um, and so I think basically that what we can learn from the case in Brazil is that we need to not focus on individual bad police I mean it would be nice if some of them would be taken to justice but we need not to focus on the individual bad police or whether they meant to kill or not but we need to focus on the resources that shift weapons and military technologies and military logics into the police and we need to find ways to s cut off those supplies and we need to find ways to change culture including media culture and other kinds of political cultures that need to focus on citizenship rather than on repression as the object of police uh, services in the United States. So uh, another question that I think certainly relates to uh, Brazil and to Egypt, but also possibly to the United States, is what is the difference between off-duty and on-duty policing? Mm. And how does that play into what we're seeing here? Off-duty and on-duty <laughs> policing. Well, I, what we've seen become very controversial um, in both these cases of Egypt and in Brazil are you know what happens when police start to work extra jobs on the side whether they're just working as private security guards for the rich or whether they're working as kind of you know some of these countries as kind of mercenary special ops forces that are kind of privatized that are doing their own thing either for landowners or for the Chiquita Banana Company in Latin America or for airports and you know so I think what happens when um, I mean of course there's a whole other practices of when police start to participate in trafficking militias and obviously forms of um, corrupt and illegal um, practices which happen all the time in Brazil and Egypt but what is most obvious and explicit and what we can stop more easily is this practice of police doing second jobs that are in these more um, security and military roles because again it trains police to think of the world as a threat rather than think of the world as populated by citizens and once police get used to that idea that the world is a set of threats and that they're in attack mode then policing stops being policing and it starts to become a military occupation Excellent. I'm going to focus on the second chapter of your book, particularly Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, how has the Brazilian government used the rhetoric of globalization conscious cleansing and reform mm. to tourism spaces, and subsequently tourism's potential to economically benefit cities like Rio, 
to then justify policing of sex workers in these areas beyond the legal precedent. Mm. Right, so that's really important because now we had last year the World Cup in Brazil. We have the Olympics coming up uh, next year. Um, so Brazil is very interested in making the most of this opportunity to promote tourism, to change the country's image, um, and to open up public spaces, but mostly to a certain kind of visiting consumers. Um, now, in previous periods, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, you know, Brazil as an erotic destination was also heavily exploited by the state itself. The state was um, very interested in promoting the uh, Brazil as a, they even used the term erotic democracy as a kind of, you know, democracy that, you know, and of course a lot of mythic dimensions to this, not necessarily as nice in reality as in the imaginary, but where people of different races, of different national backgrounds, of different class backgrounds would mix in this kind of erotic set of spaces around carnival, around samba, the beaches, you know, this is kind of Brazil's um, classic reputation, which is, of course, has a lot of myth as well as reality. Um, so what we're seeing now is a real struggle because actually, you know, there are many progressive social groups now that in a sense embrace that erotic democracy as a good thing, even though it was always kind of full of myth and a lot of um, idealizations. But, you know, again, people, women's rights activists that support the rights of sex workers, gay and lesbian rights activists that support public um, space for LGBT groups, or the movements in the uh, mostly black favelas, the popular slum neighborhoods in town, that are fighting for the dignity of Afro-Brazilian religious practices, which now are also being targeted as kind of um, an embarrassment to the country's reputation. So they're fighting for a kind of cultural mix of kind of cultural sexuality rights. So, but now we're seeing, so this, this kind of, it used to be kind of a stereotype that a lot of people critique has become kind of revived as a platform for people to defend um, a different kind of Brazilian um, mix of human rights and sexuality justice. But the temptations of kind of cleaning up the streets in order to attract a very elite corporate kind of tourist fuel these much more repressive measures. And again, the military now, the military, not just the police, are getting involved in um, making sure that they're going to occupy the areas around the Olympic events or the sports events. And uh, this moralistic discourse, again, targeting what used to be kind of glorified as Rio's sexual reputation is, is becoming more and more um, mainstream, um, this kind of repressive response to a kind of public sexuality and mingling. So, but we'll, so we will see. I mean, at this point, the new development actors don't seem, they, they seem to be really um, interested in this much more repressive campaign. They've been taken in by the moralistic and humanitarian discourse, but it really is, you know, basically a discourse of middle class respectability, which is very repressive for many of these groups that um, come from other class backgrounds or have a different agenda about sexuality in public space. All right, so switching gears from uh, Brazil to Egypt, uh, chapter three of your book focuses primarily on Cairo. You make a distinction in that chapter between two groups that you call the heritage bloc and the morality bloc. Can mm. you explain the significance of these terms? Well, in this kind of tying to what we were talking about in terms of tourism, in that part of the part of the book, um, when I'm going back between Cairo and Rio, I'm talking about these new kind of elite upper class or upper middle class tactics to kind of recolonize working class or popular neighborhoods and popular public spaces and to, um, you know, to use this kind of missionary language of social cleansing and moral uplift in order to justify displacing the people that use those spaces and to sell them to new, um, more high-class 
publics. So there's a mix of this kind of problem of class displacement with this discourse of kind of moral policing. So the heritage block um, was the heritage block versus the which other block we were morality. talking about? Morality block, right? Because <laughs> I know those four blocks. I didn't know which two you were looking at. Oh, right. So the morality block versus the heritage block. So that's exactly these two distinct but increasingly intersecting groups, these blocks, these groups of interests that mor the morality block having a very distinctive and explicit kind of religious project coming from a particular charismatic new kind of Salafist tradition, which is kind of like the, the um, Islamic version of kind of born again Christian, mm -hmm. very charismatic, very much focused on transforming the self based upon preachers who are going around in neighborhoods talking about new ways to improve your lifestyle, to, to um, rescue your family from destitution and indignity, to transform your, your identity and your body, but in ways that are very morally conservative. They're focused on kind of saving yourself from um, this, this um, moral challenge, but also transforming your family in a way that restores a very conservative role for women that restores a particular class hierarchy it doesn't challenge the differences between the marginalized working classes and the you know, morally redeemed middle classes so anyway we have this class project that i call the morality block i use the term morality instead of calling it you know the salafist or islamist block because i don't want us to think about this as some unique problem of a traditionalist islam this morality block, we certainly see it all the time in the United States. We certainly see it in Brazil. It's very, very similar. It has nothing to do with any particularity. Well, it has a lot to do with particularities, but it it's, it's mostly resembles in many ways these formations you see around these middle class, um, charismatic, um, uh, religious, family-oriented groups in many countries. So this morality block, what I show in this chapter is how then a group of people around the that want to take these uh, architectural landmarks these heritage sites in Egypt and transform them into very high five-star expensive tourist destinations they actually kind of use and appropriate the moral crusade language of these middle class and lower middle class religious charismatics and then so that's the way that these very wealthy kind of tourism promotion groups by marrying themselves with the moral rescue agenda of these religious charismatics they're able to then deploy a very thorough social cleansing scheme that purges many of these working class neighborhoods and erases the public uses of many of these public spaces so again it's a way that basically um, in this case, a kind of religious missionary politics is picked up on by people who aren't particularly religious. They just want to make more money and they want a justification to kick out other groups. And so we again have this kind of morality campaign standing in for a much more um, direct form of social um, repression and, and, and dispossession. All right. And also in that chapter, uh, spent a lot of time focusing on uh, Muhammad Atta, who was one of the hijackers of American Airlines Flight 11 mm -hmm. that uh, was used in the September 11th attack at mm -hmm. the World Trade Center. Uh, it's actually the title of your chapter is Muhammad Atta's Urbanism, if I'm correct. So mm -hmm. can you spend some time discussing Atta's concept of urbanism and why you thought it was important to mm -hmm. include it in your chapter? Right, so this is one of the themes of the book, again, is to try to find ways to um, to get us beyond the big binaries that, that govern our way of thinking ever since the war on terror age or in Latin America, the kind of age of the fall of dictatorship and the rise of narco-traffic is what everyone, uh, everyone's security concerns orbit around. So to find new ways to talk about a world without falling into the logics of, um, of the fears around terrorism and trafficking. So this chapter, I actually am the only one that ever got a hold of Muhammad Atta's master's thesis. Um, 
because it had been hidden by the German academic system after the attacks on the World Trade Center. But I'd heard, because actually I'd heard from way back in the day when I was living in Cairo in the 90s, that he was actually doing research in the same neighborhood as I was. And so we had kind of this strange, almost intersection in the 1990s, and I'd heard that he had done a thesis about this kind of heritage rescue of rescuing these beautiful old medieval um, architectural buildings in Cairo and of transforming the middle class and working class neighborhoods around them. And so I heard he had done this work and I was doing that kind of work too. So I'm like, wow, I need to see what this guy came up with and then how did this somehow drive him? Was it connected at all to the, his, his then increasing militancy and eventually leadership of the uh, attacks in New York? So, so he, again, in the chapter, he kind of represents this most, you know, actually not that, that much more extreme, but of course the implications much more extreme, but he represents actually kind of a um, perfect crystallization of this intersection between these elite, um, very much class prejudiced, upper middle class heritage developers. And then on the other hand, this charismatic, moralistic, um, uh, religious transformation that focuses very much on resegregating gender on creating a very um, class and gender segregated public space and on governing and individual desires through this kind of constant focus on the discipline and spatial segregation of men's and women's bodies of rich and poor bodies so actually his thesis ended up being a perfect example of he wanted to transform Cairo by transforming the street systems so that women would live in cul-de-sacs and have their little market jobs and vending jobs and men would live in the men would work in the broader avenues and have access to different kinds of modern commerce and tourists would be allowed to visit Cairo he encouraged tourism in these monument and heritage sites but they would only be going through the the broader men's spaces and never encountering women who were to be uh, excluded and kind of morally disciplined in these other areas. So his interesting thing about his thesis is that it kind of revealed the um, you know the kind of radical um, implications of this mix of class and gender security that was talked about in very mainstream ways in Egypt during this period. So again, it's as if one of these Operation Princess guys from Rio de Janeiro went off to lead a major terrorist attack. It's it's that there's something in the the missionary character um, of these rescue campaigns and their resort to a kind of extremely hierarchical notion of how to control sexuality, public space, and gender that has in it the the seeds of something that's much more sinister in the end of this global project that has a power that again if we trace it instead to these kind of forms of urban and moral social transformation I think it's much more interesting than if we just say oh well he was a radical Islamist and was attacking US imperialism well actually he was a urban planner and he got really pissed off at the West because of the way he saw gender and class and morality being corrupted in Cairo. So that's a very different story. And I think it's really interesting to put it back in that context. All right, well, this has been very eye-opening. We're going to uh, take a short break, and then we're going to come back uh, to talk a little bit about uh, your career and some advice for students. We'll be right back. you're listening to a podcast from Global Society's Journal. We're back with um, Paul Lamar. We've just had a great discussion about his book, The Security Archipelago, and now we are going to talk about his career and some advice for students. Um, Professor Lamar, at what point in your career did you know you wanted to pursue research in the social sciences? Uh, well, I, as a student, um, did a lot of study abroad programs. I think I've, in my life I've done seven study abroad <laughs> programs, wow. and that really was transformative for me. Um, I started off as an undergrad very much 
focused on the arts. I was a fine art major studying painting. I had a music scholarship. I was like a drummer and I was in jazz orchestra. And, but first summer, even, even you know, on my way to, um, even the summer before I went to undergrad, I, was, I studied abroad in Spain for the summer on like one of those high school study abroad things. And on the way to Spain, our flight stopped in Morocco. And now uh, my father's family has a bit of Moroccan heritage. That's where my name Amar comes from. So that was my first time there. And basically when we traveled from Morocco to Spain, we kind of traveled amongst Moroccan labor migrants, workers coming from Morocco to Spain. So back then between high school and college, I already started to think of, you know, what is going on with there's kind of racial prejudice about Moroccans. There was the labor questions. There was the cross-border flows between Europe and the Middle East. So I started to get interested in what would become these questions of race and labor and migration. And I knew I didn't want to look at this as just a question of religion and culture, even back in those days. I knew, even though I was really interested in culture and the arts, that I liked the political dimensions and the social justice questions more so that you know carried on I then went to study abroad in Morocco as an undergrad and again I was supposedly to go there to learn African drumming but I ended up working on um, migration and violence and started to see and experience police violence and then um, I moved to Egypt as just a month after I graduated undergrad and started to live there and that's when I finally gave up my aspirations to be in a filmmaker or an actor or a musician or whatever th uh, that was because I lived in a neighborhood where there was incredible police violence and there was so much repression of um, different social movements there. So I s decided, well, look, I need to understand this violence. I don't want to just respond with fear. I want to conceptualize this. I want to understand it. and. I knew from the start that I didn't just want to think of this as a problem of backwardness or Arab culture or Islam. I always I knew that um, this needed to be looked at from a fresh lens. So that's when I turned to the social sciences, started to study political sociology, political science. I started to look at cultural anthropology to understand um, bodies and gender and race. And so it was very, very exciting. But it was you know, it was really came out of my experiences and really, you know, trying to understand why these kind of violences crossing borders and that I was experiencing as I moved around, um, you know, where that came from and what could we do about it. So you were very interested with the uh, security situation in Egypt. Uh, did you spend any time in Egypt before becoming invested in politics? Well, that's that stage where I, you know, went over there to be in film and in the arts, and, and but very quickly kind of decided that what I really wanted to do was understand how people were dealing with, particularly the violence of these police forces, and which includes the paramilitary security forces, which of course now Egypt. You know, this this started in the early 90s. I lived in Egypt for eight years in total of my life and was there after the uprisings of 2011, which was such a wonderful moment of, of hope and possibility. And now, of course, there's been a backlash by the security forces and there's an alliance between the military, the police, the intelligence services, and some members of the the uh, elites and middle classes and um, so yeah it's something that concerns me and that I'm researching now you know I think we need to continue to recognize that there is so much democratic potential and so many social justice aspirations in in a place like Egypt and that the best way to support that is to just understand as deeply as possible um, where these violence um, groups come from, what interests are mobilized behind them, and how we can counter that. Yeah. Um, can you talk about your time spent in Rio? Um, specifically, how did you acquire your research position and support for that? Mm. Oh, in terms of finding 
uh, you know, scholarships and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so this is this is really um, key. Now, some places, for example, um, Egypt, I was able to support myself partially by teaching English. I got a, one of those teaching English as a second language degrees, and I used that to be able to teach English in Egypt. I also did freelance editing work and then began to do freelance journalism. So these are the kind of things that in some places, um, you know, you guys can make some money doing these kind of jobs. I mean, I, it's always good also to work for a few months in the U.S. and put money aside and travel then to countries that are where you can stretch the dollar a bit farther. Brazil was a little more challenging because Brazil has such a, a strong teachers union and things like that that they don't let random American young people just show up and teach English. Mm. They're like, we have Brazilian PhDs in English and they can teach the English <laughs> all we need. So it was more challenging. So I used the GLASS grant program, which unfortunately has been limited by our wonderful Congress, but hopefully that can come back. FLAS is the Foreign Language Area Studies grant program. I spent a whole year in Brazil learning Portuguese with a FLAS grant, FLAS grant. but of course I did a bunch of other things other than just learn Portuguese. Um, but there are fellowships that are, of course, the Fulbright Fellowship, which is a great fellowship to apply to. There are all kinds of non-governmental organizations that you you can not really earn much money, but you could intern with them. If you save up some money and then go down there, you can get involved. There's all sorts of amazing student organizations there you can partner with. And UCSB has a great study abroad program in Rio, and I think they're connected to some really great programs also in Bahia in the Northeast, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful kind of center of black culture and activism. So yeah, I think you just um, mix um, official study abroad with saving up money and finding cheap ways to persist over there. And then, you know, teaching English, journalism, all these other freelance occupations can help you stretch your time. So what kind of uh, non-university related jobs have you had that have helped push forward your research interests? Uh, well, um, other than working at the university, I worked at, at United Nations Development Program for um, five years. And that was working largely on issues of demilitarization um, in El Salvador and Central America demilitarization of paramilitaries in Colombia, and I also worked on the Israel-Palestine Peace Accords of 1993, the Oslo Accords, um, got to write letters between Rabin and Arafat and things like that. It was very exciting, although the implications of that peace accord are incredibly disappointing at this point <laughs> in time, sadly. But uh, so working for international institutions is a wonderful experience. I got started there as a temp which is actually the best thing to do, not as an intern. Interns are usually suckers, you know, that make <laughs> photocopies and bring coffee. But temps actually have a lot of work and responsibility to do. So that was an easy way to get started. I just went to the office that the U United Nations drew its temps from and got started that way and then was hired in. Um, so that was important. I also worked, as I mentioned before, for a long time as a journalist. And that was great because I kind of was like the urban subcultures journalist and wrote about clashes in urban neighborhoods and and um, that was great. Nowadays you can do a lot of that online. It's just harder to make money, but you can certainly get yourself visible and make your mark. I try to tell students that, you know, no matter how, what stage you are in your education, you can always decide you're a specialist in something. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing to do as soon as possible. You can change that specialization every month, every year, <laughs> maybe not every month, but every year, mm -hmm. but, but it enables you to, there's no reason why you have to be a sophomore as your identity. You can be, no, I'm a specialist in gender and human rights, or I'm a specialist in the mining industry, or I'm a specialist in music and justice in the Middle East, or I'm a specialist in 
police violence in Latin America. I mean, anything that's interesting to you can be your identity, which makes your relationship to the world much more serious, you know? So I started traveling when I was 15 years old, and first I was a specialist in, you know, African music, and then I was a specialist in Egyptian film, and then by the time I was 20, I was pretty firmly established as a specialist in paramilitarization, policing, you know, so I'd made these huge shifts. But I think it was really good for me to have not just be like a kid, but to be someone who thinks of himself as a specialist in something who's going out in the world to find that thing and explore it in a deeper way. So then, you know, you tend to make, get more interesting publications at an earlier time, you make better networks, and there's no reason why you can't start that when you're, when you're an undergrad. Excellent. Um, so after such an amazing career, how did you end up at UCSD? Oh, yeah, well, that was, that was really a great shift. I was a professor in Brazil. I'd started as a Fulbright professor um, after I got my PhD in New York at NYU. And so I was a Fulbright professor for a year, and then I was hired by that university in Rio, in Niterói. And um, so, but then basically, problem which I'm sure many people will have, is that I couldn't pay my student loan and work in Brazil. I was just not able to like make the dollar conversion. So I was basically gonna have to become one of these Brazilian fugitives and never return. <laughs> no. So yeah, so I went on the job market in the US. Um, and uh, yeah, and fortunately one of the jobs was at UC Santa Barbara, which ended up being a fantastic place because UC Santa Barbara um, has a really nice mix of progressive sociologists, of course global studies, which is a pioneering field here. Also has great people that work on race, feminism, gender. And it has a, you know, it has a campus that, because I think we don't have a business school or a law school or a medical school, social scientists and more activist engaged faculty have a little bit more visibility, a little bit more of a community here. We're not kind of sitting underneath the weight of those huge professional schools like they would be at UCLA or Berkeley. So yeah, so it's a great place to be, but I still constantly travel to the Middle East, Latin America, and maintain some amazing engagements there and commitments there. And yeah, and I bring that hopefully back to the classroom and keep things changing and interesting every term. And it might be hard to top yourself with your advice about <laughs> identifying as a specialist with this last question, but uh -huh. do you have any uh, final words of advice uh, that you'd like to give to any students who might want to pursue research in global phenomena uh -huh. or social sciences in general? Well, I think, you know, the point is to really be bold and to get out there, but to, again, you know, prepare yourself really, really well. That doesn't mean being conservative or waiting forever, but that um, learning a language um, you know, taking an intensive language class, developing this set of special specializations, right? So you have an identity other than just, I'm an American student going abroad and I speak five words of the language. Mm. No, you do not want to do that. You want to be someone who has got a pretty high conversational fluency in a language and who is proud to be a specialist who has read tons and seen all the films on that topic and is really amazingly inspiring in terms of that you care about a certain couple of topics and that you've done nowadays you can what I couldn't do back in those days is you can actually find on the internet or through all sorts of networks you can find people that are like yourself in another country that are you know young specialists in that same area and so you can really hit the ground running and have a phenomenal experience um, so in terms of that international education side I think that students need to be have so much fun and be really bold if they're preparing themselves in this way at home you know I think we now have more resources at a place like UCSB for students to be kind of global 
and engaged you know every week during the school term so there's ways students you know could go see great speakers and great films and meet them and talk to them I mean I think there's only certain students you know there's only like five percent of students that actually kind of come to see professors in office hours that actually follow up with professors on their very specific interests not just is this going to be on the exam but literally like here's what I'm passionate about this is what I want to learn more about who can you connect me with in the world that's working on that very very few students take that up I think they still think that this is a high school where they just have to do what they're told but we're not you know we are all actors in the world and students are actors in the world and students can really have a window to everything they want if they take advantage of what's here so just encourage people to to engage and to present themselves in ways that will really be memorable and that will launch them into this these new adventures all right well it's been amazing thank you so much for being part of our thank first you guys ever podcast. Yeah, thank you yay all right thanks a lot all right good luck thanks we'll talk to you all soon <laughs>